Thank you to the music team for leading us in worship through music this morning. While we have been looking at the Ten Commandments over this last little bit, and we are on to commandment number three this morning, we've been looking at the Ten Commandments and how they are rooted in who God is and His revelation given to His people and to the world. As we've been looking at these commandments and talking about them, We've seen that these commandments, as we relate to them within our relationship with God, give us an expression for what it is to love God and to love others. After the commandments teach us of our need for God, before we are in a relationship with God, the commandments teach us of our need for God, that it is impossible to keep them without divine aid. After We declare the Lord Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior. Our relationship with these commandments change, and they become for us our expression of worship and love. They help to express for us what it is to love God well, to love God first and at the center, that we serve Him, love Him well, and serve Him with our all. These commandments teach us what it is to love others well, Love others well, for our worship and relationship with God isn't, combined, isn't confined to something of God and us, but God expects our relationship with Him to influence our relationship with one another. And so the commandments teach us how to love others well. And lastly, I've said that the commandments, as the people of God participate in them, they identify us to the pe- as the people of God to the world around us. And as we relate to God with these commandments, they're intended to create thirst for a world that does not know God. That as they see what it looks like to love God well, to love others well, that others would be drawn to be restored to God themselves. These commandments are not subject to public consensus, or the opinion of the majority. Rather, the foundation of the commandments is a belief in the existence and the supremacy of God, the creator of God. God who spoke these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Or in other words, for us in our conduct, I am the Lord your God who rescued you. Therefore, these are my commandments. We've looked at the first two commandments. You shall have no other God before me. And we've talked about the exclusivity of our relationship with God. We've looked at the second commandment. You shall not make for yourself an idol. And we've talked about how don't customize God. Don't customize God and seek to change him into someone of your own design. For many in our world today worship a God of their own imagination, not the God who revealed who he is when he says, I am. And so we are told in the second commandment not to make ourselves an idol, a false image, a God of our own creation, of our own imagination. This morning we look at the third commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Or in the New International Version, it's translated, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. As I've talked about with the kids, none of us like when our name and the concept of our identity and who we are, none of us likes when that is made fun of or belittled or turned into a joke. God doesn't like it either. And so the commandment, part of our worship with God, has to do with how we relate to his name. Now, the thing is, we tend to think of this commandment in terms of profanity. We tend to think of this commandment as, if I haven't used God as a curse word, if I haven't used the name of Jesus as a curse word, or used the name of God to call down damnation on other people, then then, then I've kept this commandment. That really doesn't reach the heart of it. For even as a rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, Technically, I have kept the commandment. Jesus said, no, actually, they're much deeper than that. And they take us into much deeper places. 
For in truth, the essence of this commandment goes much deeper than the kind of language that comes out of our mouth. Yes, that's part of it, but it only scratches the surface. So this morning, what does it mean for us to not misuse the name of God? What does it mean for us to honor the name of God? And one of the things I hope that we see in this is that it brings our relationship with God from the private to the public. It brings our relationship with God from the private spheres into public life because names are about identity. Names are about identification and names are about reputation. For you and I, if we are in relationship with God, if we are able to declare and in agreement when God looks at us and says, I am the Lord your God. If we are Christians who carry the name of Christ, then we carry the Lord's name. And as such, to misuse the name of God is what we do when not just our speech, but our lives in total detract from the reputation of the God that we claim to be in relationship with. So as we look at this commandment, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Yes, it has something to do with the kind of words that come out of our mouth, but it goes much deeper than that. For it speaks to a people who are called by my name. If my people who are called by my name, it speaks to a people who are called by the name of God and how they carry about the reputation and name of God in their life. So if you have your Bibles, we're in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 7. I'm going to read the text, and then we're going to talk, talk about it. I'm going to break it down a little bit, because I want what I'm saying to be connected to the text. If you listen to a sermon, and the words that the preacher is saying cannot be connected to the text of Scripture, you have not listened to a sermon. You have not listened to God's Word. It's more important that you're connected with the words of Scripture than the words that come out of my mouth. So if you've got your Bibles, Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. In the commandment, it reads this way, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So to begin with, what is God's name? What is God's name? We, we, we use the word God, but we're not the only ones that use the word God. In the English language, the word God is used in all different contexts, in all different languages or, you know, all different places. And God, as we refer to God, I mean, if I was in Spanish, I would be using Dios. Dios is a Spanish word for God. It was talking French. I can't, I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce it. Uh, uh, do you? Fran, you got to help me out here. It's close? I'm close. Okay. So we're not just talking, as we're talking about the name of God, we're not just talking about a phonetical expression that comes out of our mouth. In Hebrew and Canaanite times, the, the, the generic word for God was El. El. So as you're looking at Hebrew and translating one language to another, El is what we translate as God. And this was the generic name for God as far as the Hebrew and the, Can and the Canaanite people went in the Old Testament. And from that, we have a number of different derivatives that speak of God's name. Sometimes God is named, is described as Elohim, which is a mean, name that means absolute, infinite God. Or God's name has been named El Shaddai. El Shaddai. El is God. Shaddai is Almighty. And so we speak of God's name in the Scripture. His name describes who He is. El Shaddai, God Almighty. El Olam, which is the God of eternity. El Roy, the God who sees me. Adonai is a name in scripture that is translated Lord. And all of these are names of God that we find in the Old Testament. Now one perhaps that you've heard before is Yahweh. And Yahweh is sometimes pronounced or, just, or as Jehovah. And I'm going to explain the difference of in that in a moment. But Yahweh is God's personal name as he reveals it in the scripture. And it means he who is or who causes to be, the self-existent one. And translated into English, it is I am. 
I am. And those words, I am, are sometimes pronounced as Yahweh or Jehovah. And so maybe you've heard the phrase, behold, hold Yahweh Jireh or Jehovah Jireh, which is the Lord will provide, or Yahweh Shalom, the Lord is peace. One day the Lord Jesus was talking to a group of people and he said, and he referred to himself, the Lord Jesus referred to himself as I am. And this was one of those occasions where the Lord Jesus was, was speaking of his deity, of the fact that he's second person of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We worship one God who is a triune God. And when you want to know, as, as we listened to uh, Pastor Brent last week, if you want to know what God looks like, what God is like, look at Jesus. For Jesus is the total expression of who God is as the second person of the Trinity. And Jesus once called himself, I am, and the people around him got stones to stone him because they thought he was blaspheming God by equating himself with God of whom he was. In Exodus chapter 3, Moses was being called by God to go to the Israelites who were slaves in Egypt. He was being sent there as a prophet and a leader and a deliverer of the people. In verse 13 it says, and, and Jacob read it for us earlier, if I come to the people and they ask me, what is his name? So that I'm coming to you with the, I'm coming to you, the God of your forefathers. Well, the Israelites lived in a land where there were all kinds of gods that were worshipped the God of their ancestors, but we read about in scriptures how God had to separate and had to help them sort through all their false worship as well. Moses asked, so who should I say has sent me? And God responds and says, I am. I am who I am. And that English translation, that's, it's four words, it actually translates four letters. Four Hebrew consonants, which would be the equivalent in English of Y-H-W-H. And that one Hebrew word is translated, I am who I am. And what does it mean here? It gets a little confusing, but this is where, where we understand a little bit on how English is not the first language of the scriptures. So as God spoke, and it's these words in Hebrew, Hebrew did not have any written vowels. They were just put in place while you spoke. So if you imagine speaking in English, if you were looking into a book and I was to remove the vowels of the sentences, chances are you'd have a pretty good idea of what that sentence meant still. In Hebrew, they would speak and there would be vowels in their language, but when it came to writing, the vowels were not included in the word. And so the word, the personal name that God gave, I am who I am, is actually an English translation of these four Hebrew consonants, Y-H-W-H. Hebrews didn't have written values. They added it in their speech. And so for them, in order to not be guilty of using the Lord's name in vain, when they heard this commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord in vain, they said, well, you know how we can be sure that we don't do that? We'll just never say the name. We'll just never say God's name. And so over 5,000 times in the Old Testament, you will see the word Lord. And it's a substitute, the word Adonai, that means Lord. And that will be used in place of I am who I am. God's personal name, Yahweh. Some modern translations you will see that they have taken Lord and they have put Yahweh in there. The actual Hebrew language will use the word Yahweh. But because the Hebrew people did not want to be guilty, they simply said, we just won't use God's name. We'll put a substitute in there. And what happened over time, what happened over time is the people of God, the Israelites, they lost the original pronunciation for God's name as was given in Exodus chapter 3. They lost that pronunciation. And so for a time, people thought that the way to pronounce it was Jehovah. 
And maybe sometimes you've wondered, well, why is it sometimes we sing songs and it's Jehovah and sometimes we sing songs and it's Yahweh? It might be neither of those. But what happened is this Hebrew word in the Bible was, was lost as far as how to properly pronounce it. And so for a time, they believed it was Jehovah, the right pronunciation. But more linguistical study into pronunciations, especially around the J sound, have left many scholars leading towards Yahweh being the pronunciation of this name, which tends to be more widely used now. Neither is right nor wrong. It's not right nor wrong to say Jehovah or Yahweh, and it may turn out to be that it's neither of them. We simply don't know. We have four consonants of which the vowels have been re removed. And because the Hebrew people did not want to be guilty of using the Lord's name in vain, they just simply didn't use the name. They substituted it with something else until the pronunciation of that name, of how to read that verse in Exodus chapter 3, was lost through history. Now here's the thing when you take a look at this verse. When you get caught up in the pronunciation of a word, the phonetical saying, they actually miss the point. They actually miss the point. Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. How ought we to read this verse? It says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Again, the English translation of the Hebrew language, the word take means to care Carry, bear, or contain. You shall not carry within yourself. You shall not contain within yourself the name of Yahweh, translated Lord, your Elohim, your absolute infinite God. You shall not carry or contain the name of the Lord, your God, in vain. Now, what does the word vain mean? I never hear that word vain without hearing, I mean, my house growing up was not a religious house at all. My house growing up, the radio was on 24 hours a day, I think. And so uh, whenever I hear the word vain, immediately coming to the, uh, my mind is the song where it goes, you're so vain. I bet you think this song is about you. Yeah, some of you remember that too. What does the word vain mean? The idea that's meant to be communicated in this verse is emptiness, falsehood, worthlessness or deceitful. What I want us to see is that this commandment is about so much more than religious profanity. It is so much more than whether you have used the name God in a different context or in a lighthearted way, or that you've used the name of Jesus as a swear word. I think there's part of that. I mean, we need to respect the name of God and how we talk about God, but this commandment is so much more than that. My translation of this verse would go something like this. You shall not carry or contain within yourself the renown or the reputation of Yahweh your God with emptiness or deceit. The name is about reputation. Name is about identity. You shall not carry within yourself the reputation, the renown of Yahweh your God with emptiness or deceit. God's name carried in our lives without substance, emptiness, or deceit. I think of the celebrity shows or the politicians on TV as they, as they just very flippantly use some phrase of God when the context of everything else that they're going about has nothing to do with God. It's using God, it's using God in a vain way, in an empty way, where there is no substance attached to it. See, names are about identity, names are about identification, and names are about reputation. We, are, we have a preconditioned association that is formed when you hear a name. For instance, when you meet somebody with the last name of Roberts, or even if you meet somebody with the name Kevin, you are preconditioned by the last experience you had with somebody with that name. Right? If you meet somebody who's a Roberts, you immediately go back. And if your last encounter with a Roberts was a positive, affirming encounter, then you're, more, you're preconditioned to react 
to this present Roberts in a certain way. But if your last reaction and experience was they were a complete idiot, that becomes your preconditioned association when you meet that name today. Every kid with an older brother or sister has experienced this in school, right? When your older sister was really good at academics or really good at sports or maybe was a really good troublemaker. Every kid's experienced this. They go up and the teacher that meets them hears their last name and says, ah, oh, okay, there's a preconditioned association on what to expect because you hear that name. I wonder if you're as smart as your older sister. I wonder if you are going to be the troublemaker that your older brother was. This is what's connected with a name. Names carry with them identity and reputation. So the question becomes, how do we carry about the name of God? Not just in the words that we say, but in the totality of our life. How are we caring about the name, the identity, and the reputation of God? When we go through believer's baptism, this public declaration of faith, this publicly identifying with the Lord Jesus Christ and His church, we are baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. There's an identification that takes place. We go public as we carry that name of Jesus and call ourselves Christians. Christ's ones. Is it possible that we can misuse that name and to carry about the name and reputation of God in empty and deceitful ways? That's the main point this morning. I mean, we do not misuse the name of God primarily in our tongue and in our voice. That's part of it. But we misuse the name of God primarily when our behavior the way we live our life is inconsistent with the honor and reputation of God. Dear people, if you're here this morning and you are a Christian, you carry the family name. If you are a Christian here this morning, you carry the family name. And God says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Your life shall not misuse the name of the Lord God, your God. So the question I'm left with is, what does my life, what does your life, how does our church contribute positively or negatively to the name and reputation of God? Particularly, this comes out in times of crisis. Particularly, this comes out through times of crisis. Churches and Christians go through all kinds of crisis and conflict. How do we carry the name and reputation of God? I mean, I've seen some really goofy arguments in church over my years. I mean, I've had mediated arguments over, over the flower garden at the church. Not this one. I had one lady get upset and leave the church because they were upset the color we painted the inside of the building. How does these kind of things reflect the name and the reputation of God? Why did you leave your church? Well, I left my church because I didn't like the paint. Seriously. How does that contribute positively or negatively to the name of God? I met somebody this last week in our community for the very first time. I'd never, never met them before. And uh, once again, the conversation as you meet people, not just here but elsewhere, is how Christians and churches navigated a recent social crisis that we're all very aware of. What kinds of things took place within our churches? What kinds of things? And all across our country, all across our denominations, as I've had conversations with pastors, why, where are you at after the things that have happened over the last years? And I've come up with a pretty standard answer when I look at it, because you know what? The last social crisis isn't the last one you're going to experience. There's another one coming two years, three years, five down the, years down the road. There is always another either personal or corporate crisis in the winds. That's life. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. It's not going away. The question becomes, though, as Christians, how do we carry the name and reputation of God when we go through personal and corporate crisis? 
my answer, my sta pretty standard answer that I've come up with now when this topic comes up, when people, uh, whether community or Christians or pastors, talk to me about it. Um, for Christians, what the rest of the world does in the midst of crisis isn't really my concern. But for churches, it always must firstly about, be about Jesus because we carry about within us the name and reputation of Jesus. So when people ask me questions about what happened and what behaviors and what do you think about this and that, my answer now is to turn it into a different question instead. My challenge is this. Take your Bible, read Matthew chapter 5 to 7, Jesus' first recorded public sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, the heart of the values of the Lord Jesus and his kingdom. Read about when he says, blessed are the merciful. Read about what he says about humility and meekness. Read about what he says about going the second mile. And when somebody asks you to go one mile, you're not obligated to do the next, but go the second mile. Read what Jesus says about how to pray and how to pray when you feel persecuted. Read what Jesus said when he said, don't make your worries in life the most important thing and don't think that you need money to be safe. Instead, Jesus said, seek first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek first. How do we carry the name of Jesus in our lives, in our community, in our home, in our churches, particularly in seasons of crisis? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things are going to fall in line along the way. And so my challenge for Christians when we look at how we interact, how we carry the name of Jesus in crisis, take a look at what Jesus taught in Matthew 5 to 7. Read those chapters, read them slowly, and measure your Christian behavior by what is written there. And once you measure your Christian behavior by what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7, his first public sermon that we have recorded, once you measure be your behavior by what is written there, then did you, did we, add positively or detract from the name and reputation of Jesus. Because it's about Jesus first. His name is lifted up first. His name, his glory, his reputation must be the first priority for his people. If we added positively, great. If not, what will we do going forward? Because you see, we will experience more crisis in life. We will experience unwanted events, personal and corporate. We will experience divorces. We will experience unfair workplaces. We will experience the loss of health. We will be in the midst of natural disasters. We may receive evacuation orders because of forest fires or because of floods. We will experience crisis in the world that we live in. And in so many ways, who we are and what we really believe and what really matters to us, they will spill over in the reactions to crisis. How will I, how will we carry the name of Jesus in the midst of whatever is next? And what will we be saying about God? That is where it starts. Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God in vain. Do not carry, take, contain within yourself the reputation, the renown of the Lord your God in an empty or deceitful way. See, how will the next person experience what will the next person's experience be? And how will the next person's experience with a Roberts, a Sontag, an Ostowich, a Bersay? How will that next person's experience with a Christian, a Christ follower, be preconditioned by their current experience with you and with me? See, being a Christian isn't just a private, personal matter our worship and allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ will be carried with us wherever we go and in whatever we are doing. We carry the name of Jesus together. 
And so the way we live our lives in Jesus' name actually affects the way the world will interact with someone else who bears Jesus' name. It's not just about you, and it's not just about me. Verse 7 says that this is a commandment with consequence. God will hold us accountable for how we handle his name. But I want to finish with this. We have a few minutes left. The commandments are always meant to lead us towards our need for grace. As we said in the beginning of this series, apart from divine help, we cannot keep these commandments. And so I cannot look and say that I have carried the name of Jesus appropriately every day and in every circumstances that I have been in in my life. I have broken that commandment. But my relationship with that commandment is different now as a Christian. Because of the cross of Jesus, I have known forgiveness, I have known grace, and a new way forward. You know what the name of Jesus means? You know what the name of Jesus means? God is my salvation. God is my deliverer. See, apart from divine health, we can't keep these commandments. And as I preach this sermon today, it might be easy for us to feel a little bit beat up. But you know, the name of Jesus means God is my Savior, my deliverer. Jesus' name is a name of grace. And when I carry about the name of Jesus, I don't want to do so with pride. I don't want to do so with arrogance. I don't want to do so pretending that I am something I am not. I want to carry about the name of Jesus knowing that I am not what I was, nor am I what I will be, but for the grace of God go I. Because I want our church to be associated with a name of grace. That yes, that doesn't mean that when we do it wrong, it was okay. It doesn't mean that when we acted as hypocrites, it was okay. And all of us have been guilty of that. But trustfully, we can be a people that knows the grace of Jesus. See, if you hear this sermon today and think, I haven't been doing too well lately at honoring the name and reputation of God in life. I'm experiencing some conviction. Well, I'm glad. That's good. I don't want to soften that conviction. It may be that you need to get on your knees at some point today and say, God, forgive me. I've been an idiot in the way I've carried your name. I don't want to soften that conviction. But I also don't want you to walk away thinking that that's the last word. The Bible says to us that he gives more grace. And when with humility we confess the places we've got it wrong and we say, I wish it had been different. There are places I have messed up in my life, my faith, my family, my church. But going forward in the grace and power of God, the name of Jesus is a name of salvation. Maybe, Lord, it can be different. And I want it to be different. I want a life that honors the name and person of God. But for the grace of God, go I. The name of Jesus that we carry ought to be associated with grace. And I believe that when our world looks at Christians today, when our world looks at those who carry about the name of Jesus, they need to see humility. They need to see that there is grace to start again. And they need to know that there's a place that they can experience it. But it must begin with the people of God laying down our pride, being willing to be broken, and let the Spirit of God lead us into places of change. This is the essence of revival. When the Spirit brings new life to the people of God. So what does it mean? You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. What does it mean for us to not misuse the name of your God? It means that we do not carry God's name in our lives in an empty or deceitful way. We contribute to the reputation of God. Worship just isn't a private thing or for Sunday mornings. But when the Lord is your God, you carry his name with you wherever you go and in whatever you do. And in the midst of that, God says, do not misuse my name. Do not carry my renown, my reputation, 
my glory in an empty way. What will it look like? What will both God and the world see in you and in me as we, the people of God, carry his name?